program is brought to you by Emory University. Hear me? Is it working? Okay. Are you ready in the back? All right. Welcome to the fourth annual Outstanding Women in Medicine program. Many of you may recall this has been called Women First in the past. Um, we changed the name to kind of broaden the scope a little bit, but we are still as initially planned, recognizing outstanding women in the field of medicine. This is part of the larger University Women History Month program. Um, and so our intent in this program is to bring outstanding women to the front to honor them and to hear their journeys as women in their field. And we try to bring you a diverse range of fields and experiences so that we can all learn and ask questions. Um, let's see. This program is sponsored by the Office of Staff Development. I am Rochelle Lehner, the Assistant Dean for Staff Development here in the School of Medicine. And I'm glad to welcome you all today. And I'm especially glad to welcome our honorees. We are doing um, video of this program, as we have in years past, so that we can put it on the Emory YouTube and on the Staff Development webpage. So if for any reason you don't want to be captured on the video, um, George is in the back videoing. You can get up and sit behind him if you prefer not to be seen. <laughs> Although mostly probably it's just the back of your head that's gonna be seen. Um, today, I've asked these women to talk about their story. They're gonna talk for about 20 minutes each. Um, and then we'll open it up for questions. And we'll move to the other second woman and open up for questions and then open it up for questions for either one. Following that, we'll present them with a slight token of appreciation. All right. Without further ado, I wanted to see, I don't think there are any of our past honorees here, but I do want to acknowledge them because they certainly have made a difference in the field. Doctors Nanette Wenger, Linda Sandalis, Carolyn Meltzer, Rogsbert Phillips, Gina Northington, and Kay Vitterini. They are the women we have recognized in years past. So let's give them a round of applause in their absence. Thank you. All right. So our two honorees today, we have Dr. Patricia Hudgens and Dr. Jeanette Guarner. Um, we're going to start, Dr. Um, Patricia Huggins, Hudgens is going to start, and I'm going to read you a little bio. Pat Hudgens is professor of neuroradiology at Emory, where she is the director of head and neck radiology and manages a busy clinical service. She is recognized as an educator in the field and is invited to lecture nationally, including at the American Institute of Radiologic Pathology. Dr. Hudgens has served as president of the American Society of Head and Neck Radiology and American Society of Neuroradiology. She received her medical degree at the University of California, San Francisco, and completed her radiology residency and neuroradiology fellowship at the same institution. Over her 22-year academic career, she has published 100 papers, multiple chapters, and has been a frequent presenter at national radiology meetings. Her major area of interest are post-operative imaging findings and staging head and neck cancer. She is currently involved in local and international radiology volunteer activities. And I think you'll learn that through those activities, she and Dr. Gorner have crossed paths and worked together. Um, Dr. Hudgens has a clinical practice at Emory, um, and she also teaches residents and fellows, cares for patients with head and neck cancer, and runs a strong clinical head and neck imaging section. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Pat Hudgens. Okay, I'll just sit right here. That's great. Um, so my, my name is Pat Hudgens, and I am a neuroradiologist, and I've been at Emory almost 26 years. So that's a really long time. And I've lived in Atlanta so long that I own my own home. So that's a, that's a great thing. Um, I, I think that one way or one place to start here is just very briefly tell you where I came from. I was an Air Force brat. I lived all over the country with my mom and dad. My dad was in the Air Force. And I got uh, very good at moving and moving into a new school, making friends, and then leaving right away. And that's probably why I I'm kind of content right now to sit and stay where I am. 
I was raised by my mom who really emphasized throughout my whole life that I had to work, that I had to be self-sufficient, and that I had to have a career. She was a housewife and she was not happy with that. And she is a brilliant woman, and I heard my whole life, you've got to work. I had my first job when I was in eighth grade, and I was a cleaning lady at the Busy Bee Day Nursery. And I went in every day and cleaned up where all the dirty diapers were and all the nasty little fingerprints and realized I didn't like that. But I worked really hard, and I was really went to high school in Amityville, Long Island. And everybody goes, like the horror? Yes, like the horror. And I'm, I'm from Amityville. And it's a very blue collar town on the south of Long Island. Um, my high school was very rough, a very rough public high school. And um, I recently met a young man here in Atlanta who also grew up in Amityville. It's hard to find people from Amityville and I asked him, did you go to Amityville High School? And he said, no, my parents would never let me go there. <laughs> so it went, my high school was not a good high school. I was one of the first people to go to college from my high school, definitely the first person in my family. And um, we didn't have much money. I didn't have any money to go away. So I did something pretty unique for people nowadays. I lived at home and went to school. I went to Hofstra University. And all through, through college, I worked 40 to 50 hours a week. So I really have worked my whole life. I worked as a key punch operator. I'm sure nobody here is young enough to remit with. OK, a few people. So I was a key punch operator. I worked four to five hours every day after going to college. I was one of the few people who wanted an 8 AM class. It cracks me up now because my son and daughter don't want an 8 a.m. class, and I was the first in line for an 8 a.m. class. And on, on the weekends, I was an EKG technician. So I worked all day Saturday and all day Sunday as an EKG technician. And so I'm laying the groundwork for a history of a real workaholic. I've worked really, really, really hard. And that's had a big impact on a lot of my life. When I got to... Um, you know, I had a bunch of different majors in, in college. I started out as a phys ed major. And we got into tumbling and walking on a, a balance beam. And I'm a five foot nine, 150 pound woman, and that didn't work for me. So because of that, I left phys ed and went into journalism. I was a journalism major for about 20 seconds. And then I just sort of floated free form and finally decided maybe I'd go to med school. And I decided that in the very end of my uh, four years to go to med school and just kind of did all the credits in the summer. And my pre-med counselor said, you need to go to a New York school because you're from New York. And I said, I bet you I can get into a California school. I was 22. I'd never been on an airplane never been on an airplane. And that was, I mean, crazy. Can you imagine being 22, never being on an airplane? And he said, I bet you you're, for, you're a New Yorker. You have a full scholarship. You have no money in your family. You're not getting into a California school. And I said, watch me. And my mom and I flew to San Francisco, and I interviewed. And lo and behold, I got into UCSF, which was such a progressive school at that time. It was, this was the mid-'80s, and they already had 40% women in their med school. It was, it was just a, a very, very heady time to be in medicine. I started in internal medicine. And this was when for, you were on call every third night. And we were on call every third night. The next day, we went home around 7 PM, and then that whole cycle started again. So I, that trend of working hard, just kind of being the, um, the plow horse in the room, that's really where I've, where I've come from. I ended up in radiology. That's sort of a long story. But I did neuroradiology fellowship at UCSF. I was the second woman to do that. My goal when I started neuroradiology, my one goal was to get through my fellowship year without crying. All the faculty were men. They were really harsh. 
and there was one in particular, I, my goal was to avoid him at all costs. That didn't work. I cried once, and, um, but, but it was a long, long fellowship. And I ended up here through a, a, a variety of different career moves. I moved here with an ex-husband who was recruited. He was a pediatric neurosurgeon, and he started a practice at, Scott, at a Scottish Rite. I came into town determined to go into private practice. I had seen a um, kind of an aggressive side of academic medicine. It was really all male. No one there looked like me or thought like me or talked like me. And so I said, this is not for me. I'm going to go into private practice. So I came here and was told by uh, radiologists in, private, in here in Atlanta that they didn't hire women. And this was in 1988. Picked up the phone, they said, no, we don't hire women. And so I said, oh, geez, that's going to be a problem for me. Um, so what did I do? I came to Emory. And I met um, the person who's had the biggest influence in my life, and that's Bill Casarella. Um, Bill Casarella is uh, the ex-chair of radiology. He's a big bear of a man, and I love him. And he hired me. And I told him, you know, Dr. Casarella, I'm not staying here. I'm here till somebody will hire me in private practice. And he said, that's OK. We're, we've got room for you. And I said, I'm going to make it a little bit harder for you. He said, I, I, said, I want to work part time. I had a new baby, and I wanted to work part time. I had a husband who was on call 24-7, and I just couldn't work full time. And he said, you can come here, you can work part time, but you will never be promoted. You will be assistant professor. And it didn't really, that didn't mean much to me. I'll be assistant professor. And after about three years here at Emory, I sat down with Dr. Casarella and I said, what do you think about you and I trying to change the policy of promotion here at Emory? And he was great. And he said something that has really resonated with me forever. He said, who defines what full time is? And who has defined five days a week, 10 hours a day as a, work, a, a working day week? Let's make a different uh, definition of, part, of what full time and part time were. So we kind of slowly, he and I set out to change the culture here about promotion. And I started, uh, when I started uh, as a member of the President's Commission on the, the Status of Women at Emory. President here had a commission uh, that included people from all walks of life here at Emory. And I was on the commission. Now, this wasn't the Dean's Committee of School of Medicine. This was the whole, the whole uh, School of Emory. And after about two or three years, I chaired that commission. And that was a really big commission. And it was there that I started to introduce the idea to the other chairs, to the committee members, and to the dean, and to the president of the university, that there were very valuable people here who worked very, very hard, and that did deserve to be promoted, even though they were part time. And right after I chaired that commission, I chaired the committee um, the Dean's Committee for the Status of Women in the School of Medicine. And that was a, a, a committee of women who answered to the Dean in the School of Medicine. I was on that committee probably five years, and very slowly but very methodically introduced the concept of the part-time person being promoted. And I was talking to Casarella several years ago, and we don't remember a change a formal legal change. Maybe, um, one, maybe our dean here remembers when that happened. But you can definitely be promoted now at Emory and be part time. I sit on the promotions committee. And when people's uh, CV comes up, there's no line that says part time, full time. We all know some of these people are part time. And when you look at their CV, you really can't tell they're part time. So that whole clock for tenure and for promotion has been prorated and um, has been changed here at Emory. And I'd like to think that Bill Casarell and I had a little piece in that. 
So I started part-time. Now there are times in people's lives when part-time works and there are times when part-time doesn't work. I was in private practice in California for about two years and I asked the group if I could go part-time and they said no. I was the first woman they had ever hired. This was in Santa Rosa, uh, Northern California. Group of men, you know, 15 men, and I said, you know, I have a, an infant at home. I have an hour and a half commute both ways. I really need to work just three days a week. And they said, no, we won't do that. And, and so I left that group. Within six months, three of the senior partners needed to go part time. One had a son who committed suicide. One developed Parkinson's disease. And another uh, went through a divorce. So they all three had times in their lives when they couldn't commit 50 hours, 60 hours a week to work. And I think the light bulb came on then for them. And so that's been a very big part of my career is, is the fact that part-time people are valuable they're worthwhile, and they should have the same promotion um, uh, capabilities of people who are full-time. The reason I started with how hard I work is just kind of to emphasize that I am a worker bee. I am really, really the Clydesdale in the room. Um, but just because you're part-time doesn't mean you're a, you know, a, 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 somebody who's not going to work hard. The second part of my career has been interesting. It's kind of coincided with sort of the third part of my life. And I've started to think about life in a really different way. I think about life now kind of in thirds, or maybe fourths. But that first third of your life, you're just learning to be in the world. You're learning to be a person in the world. Second part of your life is that really busy part of your life. And I define that as, I don't know, 20 to 40, 45. You're deciding to have kids or not have kids. You're deciding on a life mate. You're you know, becoming a, a, a real productive member of society. And you're working on your career. So you're busy. I'm out of that part of my life now. And I'm into that last third, or I hope it's not my last third, but that, that next part of my life. And this part of my life, I'm spending more time listening. And I'm more quiet and reflective and just starting to look back and, and, and see where I've been, see how I can help people who are in that second busy, chaotic part of their life, how I can help pull them forward. And at the same time, I'm trying to kind of redefine where I'm going next. And I've tried lots of different things. And I'm not sure where I'm going next. But I like Emory because they've given me a lot of opportunities to do unique things. They've let me work part time. Dr. Meltzer um, gave me the opportunity to take a six month sabbatical in 2009. And I had the chance to work as a medical student in the Brady ER. I mean, I was INDing perirectal abscesses. And I was having a ball. I love pus. So it was, it was a great time for me to, to do something different. And I'm not sure what I'm going to do next. International outreach is really important. I've been so blessed to work with Jeanette, to work with Carlos and Hank Bloomberg on the Ethiopia project. And this university has really put their money where their mouth is. And they've supported uh, people who kind of think outside the box and who want to go internationally. I've had a couple of um, interesting people who've had big impact in my life. And another was a life coach who I had a career coach, a life coach. Uh, it's a great thing. If any of you are wondering about your career or the next stage in your life, a career coach is a really good, good um, thing to work with. And I had a career coach once who said something to me that's really stuck. She said, in order to speed up, you have to slow down. And I thought that was really stupid. But it's not stupid. And it, and it you have to sit 
you have to think, you have to be quiet, maybe take five minutes outside and in nature. But once you kind of clear your head and your thinking, you can get back on your path in that busy part of your life and really speed up. And there's been another big impact in my life recently. Somebody very, very close to me has dealt with addiction. And so the past six months, I have been dealing with an addict in my life. And through that addiction, I have had a wonderful opportunity uh, to be involved with the 12-step program of Al-Anon and Narconon. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but I'm going to the Al-Anon Al Al meetings and, and Nar Narconon meetings now. And I've had a chance to go through the steps. There are 12 of them. And I call myself 11-step path because there's one step I've decided I'm going to skip. And that's, there is a step where you make amends. And you find the people in your life who you have wronged or who you have uh, kind of been outside of your life, and you make amends to those people. So it, at the meeting this week, I said, when we share, you share in the uh, Narconon meetings. And I said, hi, my name is Pat. And they say, hi, Pat. And I said, I'm going to get a t-shirt that says I'm 11-step Pat because I'm skipping that step. And so nobody liked that idea. But somebody said something else that I loved. I love, love, love this comment. And it's an Alcoholics Anonymous comment. But this person said, this is what it's like holding a grudge. And this is why you have to make amends. He said, holding a grudge is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. Isn't that great? So that's, I'm not sure where I'm going next. Um, I know it's going to have international outreach. I suspect it'll have local outreach. Thank you to the administration, to the deans who have supported that at Emory. I love that Emory's ha given us some flexibility to let our personalities come through because we are all very, very unique. And um, I just have a, a, a very long history of working really hard, but part-time people are, are really, really great. So that's my story. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story, Pat. Does anybody have any questions specifically for Pat before we move on to Jeanette? You're saving them all for the end, huh? OK. You talked about people that have been very helpful and and uh, how you you have given, you know, they're giving you opportunities to do things. How do we? ensure that we are able to provide people those opportunities. I mean, besides listening to people, what you said is very important to do. What else, how do you, how do you think we need to be imaginative, imaginative to think outside the box to give opportunities to people? I mean, I'm not sure, honestly, if I had one of my faculty members say, I want to be a medical student for six months, I would say, this is a great idea. I mean, I wouldn't want to give people opportunities that I see what's happening afterwards. But, but I want to hear what, what your thoughts are about that. Or should we just be crazy and give everybody any opportunity. I mean, what do you think? Well, no, I mean, no, of course not. I mean, the clinical service has to be covered. That's number one, number two. Um, so one thing that I've realized about life is you have to be flexible. And you probably look at somebody who's been in the same job for 26 years and who has been in the same house for 26 years as someone who doesn't, who isn't flexible and doesn't like change. But I think, I think flexibility is critical. And I think rules are made to be broken. There just are. And that's my, my, maybe that's my generation. I question authority, and I think rules are made to be broken. I think you have to be flexible. And you have to be able to, um, you have to, be able to uh, enjoy change and accommodate change. Um, you may not see an immediate yield from somebody pitching an idea to you. It may not have an immediate bottom line on a balance sheet. It may not be obvious immediately. 
But if you've got someone who's creative and clever and thinking outside the box, they're going to take you places you never could even anticipate. And so that's why I love, the, I, I love flexibility and being able to think outside the box. And there are some core things that always have to be covered, and, but short of that, and, and, and realize there may not be an immediate yield. It may be a more uh, down the road yield. I think sometimes we talk about that when we're talking about staff as the kind of intrinsic value that makes the staff feel engaged and valued in their job in which they then give back. Other questions for Pat? <laughs> it's kind of like a two-part question. One would be, um, do you have any other women in your life that have inspired you or motivated you, you kind of look to as a role model? And then, you know, the second part of that would be, when you do feel like you're frustrated or you're working a lot, or like what inspires you to keep going and not give up? You know, other than my mother, no, no. Um, you know, I didn't see any women doctors. I didn't see any women, I just didn't. I just, I, I, I know that's sad, but no, I, I don't. You know, my parents were very important to me, but that, that was, uh, no, not really. I was kind of self-motivated. I love medicine. I love medicine. Like, if I realize, and this is probably very shallow, but if you said define yourself, a doctor is number one. That's my poor children, right? You know, it's not mother, it's not wife, it's not sister, it's not daughter. I'm, I love, love, love medicine. So I'm happy doing medical in medicine. Um, as I get older, I do not have the endurance I used to have. I really don't. I need more. I, I cannot work the hours I used to work. And so that's just a, you know, a fact. But I just love what I do, so I really don't need too much push in me. Great. Thank you. Um, again, we'll open up for questions for both women after we hear from our second honoree. And with that, I'd like to introduce um, Jeanette Warner. She was brought up in Mexico, where she obtained her medical degree from LaSalle University. She did her residency and surgical pathology fellowship here at Emory. And after, re after residency, she returned to Mexico City, where she was the director of the clinical laboratory at the National Cancer Institute. In 1997, she returned to Atlanta to work at the CDC um, in infectious disease pathology. During her 10-year tenure, tenure at CDC, she was involved in the histopathologic, sorry about that, histopathologic <laughs> study of high-profile outbreaks, including the U.S. anthrax bioterrorism attack, the introduction of the West Nile virus to the Americas, and the discovery of the SARS coronavirus. In 2007, she joined the faculty at Emory, and she is currently professor of pathology and laboratory medicine. And as of next week, she'll be the director of clinical laboratories at Emory University Hospital at Midtown. And she has over 150 publications in peer review journals. With that, I'll turn it over to Jeanette. Thank you. Well, I, I have um, pictures. Oh. I'm a morphologist. And uh, as a morphologist, I guess Pat is also a morphologist. Um, we're both uh, morphologists. Uh, there it is. So as a morphologist, I like a lot of pictures. So I have a, a not, it's not a very big presentation, but um, I have lots of pictures. So I want to show a little bit of the timeline because uh, since I move back and forth between one place and the other, uh, people need to understand that um, I, I've been across the border many, many times, and not just for, um, not just for visiting my family, but to um, work and to study and to do a variety of different things. I was born in the States, in Seattle, um, when I was very, very young, and probably that was the only illegal crossing I made, because I didn't have a passport, whether it was a Mexican or an American passport at that point in time, uh, my parents took me to Mexico, and that's where I was brought up. I did my elementary school there, my high school, I did medical school there, and then I came for a little bit of time to the U.S. for um, a year and then went back to, uh, to Mexico and then came back um, to Emory 
um, spend uh, my residency training and fellowship here. And then I went back to Mexico and worked at the Instituto Nacional de Cancerología in Mexico City. Then when uh, we came back uh, to the US, um, we came to Atlanta. I started at CDC. And then I was recently, in comparison to Pat, definitely, much more recently at, uh, at Emory. I started first um, in 2007 at CHOA and then moved to um, Emory Hospital. So, and that's where I am um, currently at Emory Hospital. But I'm going to start my story uh, from a little further back, meaning um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my father. I'm going to talk a little bit about my mother. My father is a psychiatrist, but he is a collector by heart, at heart. He's always collected everything that crosses his path. And um, he was born in, in Barcelona. And um, um, at, during the Civil War, uh, my grandfather was in the wrong side of the war. So he ended up, um, they had to get um, out of Spain. And they ended up in Morocco. In Morocco, my father, um, I don't know if my father or my grandfather, but some, one of them, I assume it was more my grandfather because my father was a, a young kid. Um, but everybody says that my father was the one that won the lottery ticket. So he won the lottery in, in Morocco. And one of the things that my grandfather said, well, is uh, you cannot just spend the money in candy. Let's get something that's a little more durable. And that's when he started his stamp collection. And that stamp collection, um, traveled with him when they had to flee again, uh, Morocco, and ended up in Mexico. And that um, book um, with stamps basically was money in the bank because stamps are, are a collection that is, um, it's, it's, there's a lot of money put into them. And um, my, um, my father, unbeknownst to him, was training a pathologist when he kept on um, giving us the book and the stamps. And we had to find the stamp, because just like the booklet is here, this is how the stamp collection um, books look like. They, they have this black and white pictures. You can see the American flag here. And then they say some are green, some are blue, some are whatever. And then they say the year and different characteristics that you have to note in the stamps with different watermarks. And you have to basically be doing a lot of morphology. You're doing the morphology on the stamp and you're putting it in the album. So he basically, unbeknownst to him, a psychiatrist, was or a psychoanalyst because he later became a psychoanalyst, was, tra was training a pathologist uh, by, by doing this. My mother, on the other hand, she was born in Mexico. Both her parents are Germans and um, uh, she um, liked a lot to do a lot of things at home, and she embroidered, she knit, she did a lot of, lot of different things. I put th that um, tablecloth that's there is the second tablecloth that I made. I made it when I was about um, 12 years old. I did that one. And why did I put it in there? Um, because when you, and, and this is a, another lesson um, in my life uh, that my mother taught me is um, when you're doing a project like this, it's a big project for a 12-year-old to do something like this. So you have to plan. You have to gather all your information on you know, the size of the tablecloth. You have to gather the information of the colors you want, you know, how big these things are going to look, and you know, so on and so forth. And you do a little bit at a time. Okay? You don't plan to do this in one sitting. Okay? You, you can't do this in one sitting. You have to do maybe this corner first, and maybe you know, this will take you two weeks or three weeks to do, and then the next corner, and then the next corner, and so on and so forth. So you start building this project a little bit at a time. And another thing that is important when you're building the project, maybe the first corner doesn't come out that, that great, but it's a pain in the butt to really undo it when you're embroidering. So you basically finish one and go to the next and finish the next and go to the next. And I think that's a very important um, um, advice that I got, that my mother, without unbeknownst to them, uh, to me, uh, gave me, because that's the way I feel about writing papers. 
You know, I've written a lot of papers, and one of the things that I always do is gather all your information, and you do a little bit at a time. You don't try to, to write a whole paper in one afternoon. Because you'll, I, at least I won't be able to do it. I don't think there may be people that can do it, but I can't do it. So I always put myself little small um, goals. And I say, well, today or this week, I'm going to do the first paragraph of the introduction, then the second paragraph of the introduction. Tomorrow, I'll do you know, so on and so forth. And I really don't look back at the introduction or the method until I finish the paper. Because if I start correcting my first paragraph of the introduction, I could spend maybe, if you want, one month, two months, three months correcting it. I can always correct my papers many, many times. But it's better to correct them after you're done with the whole thing. Because then you already have the final product. And so it's easier to think about the final product once you have the final product. And then you can do the corrections um, as you go along. And the same thing happened when I was um, dancing. I started dancing when I was eight years old. And here, uh, it's my first uh, troupe. I was in the uh, junior ensemble at that time. Must have been around 11 or 12 years old, too. Um, and again, it's the same concept when you're putting a, a performance. You put, you, the, maybe the teacher or the choreographer knows the entire dance, how it's going to work. But in reality, you do it one little bit at a time. You don't put the entire thing at, on one sitting. You do one part and then the next, and then you clean up. So I think that that's, uh, those are important things that I learned, both from my not mother and from my, my uh, troop. So do a bit at a time. Don't look back until you're done. Okay. I am an, an avid reader, reader, and I read in every language that you give me. I read, um, obviously, Spanish, English. I read in French, too, not as much as the other two. But I like to read also everything. I like to read history. I like to read novels. I like to re read poetry. Now, one of the things that my father gave me when I was re relatively young, I must have been about 15 years old, is that book that says Microbe Hunters. And obviously, I took it to heart. That book tells you about the story about Pasteur and Jenner and Koch, and um, I think eventually I became a microbe hunter. I went to medical school at La Salle, as uh, Rochelle did, and that's where I met my husband, Carlos. A lot of people know him. Um, and the school didn't look as nice as it looks nowadays, but that's where the school is located. And I had, uh, obviously, influenced by two, uh, my, the two morphologists in, in, in the school. The first one, the one that's at the top of the photograph, is uh, Mariano. Ramirez de Goyado, he was my histology teacher. I couldn't find uh, the, my pathology teacher. I basically subbed, or not subbed, I um, helped both in the labs in histology and anatomic pathology at the time. Um, I wasn't sure what I was going to do, but I was already, I guess, the, the, the stamp collection had stamped me for life. Um, so I had already, I liked the idea of looking at morphology. And then I came here as a medical student. And there were, um, I rotated to several people. Obviously, there's some people that everybody knows, Ken and Dr. Hurst. Nanette, who's, one of the, who's been one of the honorees. I still remember being in the cardiology service at Grady and thinking, oh my god, <laughs> this woman knows so much. <laughs> She's amazing. <laughs> you know, she would teach all these things. And I would just listen to her and to think that right now I am, uh, you know, following her footsteps is just, uh, I, I don't think I'll ever be able to do that. But she's, uh, she, she um, I, was one of my um, attendings when I was at Grady in the cardiology floor. And David Rimbland, who's the infectious disease guy that um, I did um, my, one of the subs, also did a pathology rotation and hematology rotation. Obviously, to um, morphologist and as a medical student, who doesn't get wowed by Dr. <laughs> Dr. Sewell? Um, so, then we went back to Mexico, and um, there I um, were I, in Mexico. You do uh, five years of medical school, and then you have to do one year of what they call social service, where basically it's a payback 
of what you're doing. I ended up doing it at the Instituto Nacional de Nutrición, for short, Ciencias Médicas y Nutrición. And I did it in pathology. This is a guy that uh, was my, my mentor during that year. Uh, he's a great pathologist. I really um, have I have no words because it's really, it was really a lot of fun to work with him, spend time in the electron microscope, do a, a variety of different things. And interestingly enough, that's the first time I published anything that had to do with uh, medicine. It was something, it, we did a series on chronic, chronic ulcerative colitis, the pathology, and we published it in one of the Mexican journals of pathology. Since then, I, I just can't let the microscope go. And I have my, my, my stamp collection on microscopes here. <laughs> then I came here to do my uh, pathology uh, training. There's a lot of people here that um, you know. I see Melinda is around here. I published with, um, with George Birdson. We published an article. Um, obviously, people know Madge and know uh, Cynthia Cohen. And uh, Beth Unger is now at CDC. Um, Two people that are missing that were my mentors, Etienne Sommerin, who I've seen recently. Um, she lives um, part of the year here, and um, she's, you know, I see her once in a while. And the other person that was extremely, um, it, 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 he gave me something that I never thought at the time was going to be that important, but ended up being extremely important in my life. Um, Dr. Rex Kahn was the, the laboratory director here at Emory, but he was also the um, residency training director at the time. And when I came um, from Mexico, I said, I just want to do anatomic pathology because I'm going back to Mexico, so I might as well just do the, the, the thing that pathologists are known there. I don't really need to do all this lab medicine stuff. And he says, well, I understand that, but it'll give you a good breadth of understanding, and you'll, you'll do get better if you do one year of, of of, um, or, you know, six months of lab medicine. I said, okay, well, you know, a year is no big deal. Let's do one year. And so I ended up doing the entire, um, both anatomic pathology and clinical pathology residency training, two years of, of each. And unbeknownst to me, because I, you know, when I went back to Mexico, what I was going to do was anatomic pathology. And I actually got border, boarded in Mexico and in the U.S. And in the U.S., I got bordered with, uh, with both anatomic and clinical pathology. But in, in Mexico, I, went, I took a trip and, and um, got boarded in anatomic pathology. Clinical pathology was, there was no board in clinical pathology. But, you know, I, I went to Mexico to do anatomic um, pathology. And you'll see what happens next. So in the meantime, this woman here, one of, our, uh, one of my fellow residents, and early used to say, we all need a wife. And I think this is something that at the time, I, I thought she was a little crazy, but I thought it, it was great. Because what she wanted to have as a wife is she wanted to have somebody that would have the dinner ready for her and her husband when she came back from, rest, <laughs> from work. And I thought, OK, that's an interesting thought process. But I think I've, I've changed my way of needing a wife. Um, and I think I changed my way of needing a wife because I think to me what, I, what a wife is is somebody that is helpful to you with your kids and it's helpful to you at, at home. And I think um, to be able to be a woman with kids, having a wife that can help you with things at home, especially I don't like washing toilets. I can do the dinner, but washing toilets is not my expertise. Well, you know, I may be very good, but I don't like doing it. <laughs> so I'd rather have somebody else do that. So I think um, having, for all the, the, the young women that are having children, think about the things that you don't like doing at home and get a wife to do those things. <laughs> that's, that's something that I, I would um, counsel everybody to do. Now, we were doing residency training when, when AIDS was uh, basically discovered. And that's where my hunt for microbes started, I guess. Um, we, um, we did a lot of autopsies without knowing that they had AIDS. Um, we were hunting uh, pneumocystis pneumonia. We were hunting a bunch of different things. And we were the first ones sort of describing the epidemic as it was happening. and. Um, 
it gave me, gave me a lot of opportunity. And at that time, we were working, Carlos and I, Carlos in medicine, and I was in, in, in pathology. But it gave us the opportunity to explore a lot of these two things. And Carlos and I published several papers um, working on um, both Epstein-Barr virus and, uh, and, lymph and lymphomas in patients with AIDS and then tuberculosis in patients with AIDS and how much it had increased at Grady because of, uh, of AIDS. So we, we did a lot of things um, regarding this epidemic. Actually, after finishing my residency training I, and fellowship, I had published already 14 papers. And again, do a little at a time. Eventually, you'll get it all done. Then we went back to Mexico and um, I started doing anatomic pathology in Mexico. And I started uh, working with uh, this guy, Alejandro Moar. Um, he was the, the, the uh, subdirector, or I guess that's the, I'm not sure how you, you translate, of research in the Instituto Nacional de Cancerología. That's where I, I um, landed. And he was the director, Dr. Beltran was the director of the um, hospital. And I started in, in anatomic pathology, and I, um, we actually, with Alejandro, we got a, an R01 grant with people at Stanford looking at um, Helicobacter pylori and um, cancer in the Chiapanecan region in, in the south of um, in the border with Guatemala. That's where we were working. But then all of a sudden, um, and that was in the in the in charge of the clinical laboratory retired, and then um, for some reason that I don't understand because I wasn't involved in the negotiations, the um, instruments that they got to run their chemistries um, came with um, computer systems, and the computer system that they came with was a computer system that could get hooked up to other instrumentations. And so it was basically a laboratory information system. And um, the, this guy, especially Dr. Beltran said, I don't know what to do with this. What, how do we do this? And um, this woman said, well, I'm retiring, so I don't know what you're gonna do it because you're not gonna do it with me. And so Alejandro said, well, Jeanette trained in clinical pathology. Why don't we ask her to help us with the, in, the implementation of the laboratory information system you know, we'll pull her out of, uh, of anatomic pathology, and then she can um, work with us for, you know, six months, nine months, a year in the lab, and, and, and we are, you know, uh, computerize the lab. And, um, and they said, okay, do you want to do this? And I said, okay, that sounds like an interesting challenge. So I took that job um, of doing the, the laboratory information system, and, um, I guess I did a good job, and I liked the job, and then I ended up becoming the director of the laboratory at the Instituto Nacional de Cancerología. But it all started because they didn't have somebody that did clinical pathology and that could, um, that could implement the, the laboratory information system. So it was, um, it was very fortunate that Rex Kahn had asked me to, why don't you do clinical pathology? Because it, it eventually ended up being a job for me that I had not even planned or thought about. So I think serendipity, you sometimes don't plan where you're gonna end up and that's where you end up. And I think that's been um, very important. During that time, this is the, the information system. It's an Italian system that is translated into Spanish and that was very useful because a lot of the people in the lab did not speak but, um, but Spanish. So the fact that it was translated, it was very important. Um, in the lab, I also implemented flow cytometry. I, pl uh, I implemented cytogenetics. And one of the things that I ended up doing a lot is a lot of the techs that worked in the lab had not graduated from their, um, from their um, bachelor's degree. And so, to, because in Mexico, to graduate, you need to be a, th a thesis. And they hadn't done their thesis because they had started working and they had started earning money, so they basically decided that they were not gonna do their thesis. But doing their thesis would have increased their, their, their pay grade. But you know, they, they didn't have time, so I said, okay, all the lab techs that are um, due to have their thesis done, we're gonna get um, projects for every single one of them, and we're gonna graduate them all. And actually, I ended up graduating eight 
that were already working in the lab, and some of them even became um, supervisors in the, um, in, the, in the lab. Once the people in the National Autonomous University and other universities realized that I, I had projects in my head coming <laughs> out of everywhere, and that I was graduating people, they started sending more people, so I ended up um, doing a lot of mentoring of, um, of, of uh, laboratory techs for, for graduation. So it was a very rewarding experience. One of the other things that I did is um, I, I moved the lab. The, the lab used to be in a very small place, so we ended up moving, especially because I had the flow cytometry, the computers, the, the cytogenetics. I, I had increased the amount of uh, tumor markers that we were doing. I had expanded the menu enormously. So we, had, we moved the lab from one place. We ended up first in the kitchen because we needed to have a Bunsen burner at that time. We still did that, so we needed gas, and that was the only place that had gas. <laughs> so then we had to move back into the lab once it had been renovated. And this, um, this stamp also tells me that um, one of the reasons why we moved out of um, Mexico was uh, the hassle of living in Mexico City, 20 million people. You know, you think Atlanta has traffic? You have never driven or gone to Mexico City. That is incredible. At the time, I already had my, my two kids, um, Vicente and Victoria. Victoria was born in Mexico. Vicente was born here. Um, as I said, I acquired a wife. Her name was Magna, or her name is Magda. And she helped me with the kids, and she helped me with a lot of chores at the house. I, we really appreciated all the help that she could give us. Then um, when we came back, I came to CDC. At CDC, I had great opportunities. It was a, a, a great job in many ways. I was um, in the team that investigated the anthrax um, bioterrorism attack. I was in the team that uh, discovered um, SARS. We did a lot of work on respiratory influenza, respiratory diseases. We did a lot of work on emerging infections. This is a, 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 an example of um, monkeypox. I actually ended up publishing over a, th a hundred articles just based on the different things. I continued working on H. pylori. I continued working a lot on, um, on um, some things regarding AIDS and syphilis. So it was a very rewarding time, but I can tell you one thing. No job is, well, never, I never missed an opportunity to publish. I just, I like writing, so I kept on writing as, as much as I could. And there's, uh, there's no perfect job, I would say. One of the things that I was missing is, um, and you can see my collection stamp on education. Okay. So um, I was missing because at CDC you don't, um, you do a lot of policy, you do a lot of interesting stuff, a lot of interesting work. But during the time that I was there, there were only three people that came that were either residents or were, um, 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 in, like they call them um, emerging infectious disease interns, and they are there for a year. So uh, the opportunities of doing teaching are very small. And um, I need to thank Tris, who's here, and um, Angie, who gave me the opportunity to come to Emory and, and expand on what I was already doing and, and, and do more teaching. What do I do at Emory nowadays? I do a lot of uh, protein work. You know, you can see all the albumin and this to have an M protein. I do um, coagulation. I do interpretation on coagulation. I do um, fish for, um, for uh, a lot of the um, cancers, um, the different uh, translocations or deletions that um, patients may have in their cancer. And I continue to work at CDC. I'm a guest researcher at CDC. And I continue to um, hunt microbes. Okay, this is a, a, a um, coccidioidomycosis. So I continue to hunt microbes. And one of the things that um, has been very rewarding is expanding the education, not only to um, the residents and medical students, but to start doing some education material online, doing education um, in, in other countries, which obviously I had already done in Mexico, but um, 
expanding it to um, Africa and other places. And doing something like uh, this uh, page that we have is great. It's a page on, on, um, on microbiology and how to diagnose um, different um, organisms. We've expanded that to um, have other um, disciplines. Uh, so we're right now, we have about uh, 50 uh, modules in the, um, in the microbiology one, and we've expanded. We're right now about um, 25 modules in other areas like chemistry. And then we, all, we are starting right now with uh, anatomic pathology. So we've uh, moved. And I've been able to also do some publications on teaching. So I think that that's another um, fun thing. Never miss an opportunity to teach. So some advice I would say, a chart can always be fun. And I cook a lot. I cook with my son. My son loves cooking. So here we have the, the two of us uh, preparing um, dinner in my parents' house. Uh, I always try to ha find um, time to relax. Um, I started skiing when I was um, 30 something years old, and uh, I, I still go skiing, so it's never late to learn something. And uh, I continue to dance. I continue to dance ballet, but obviously my husband doesn't like dancing ballet. So <laughs> I haven't seen him yet in, uh, in ties, uh, not yet there. Um, so, but we, we, we like to dance, so, you know, keep dancing. And here's um, my family now, my, my son and my daughter, and my parents, um, Enrique and uh, Ursula. Thanks. Questions for Jeanette? Yes, let me bring the mic over to you, Jenny. Hi, and this is, um, it's actually a question for either of you. I'm on staff in the Office of Admissions, and so um, it's very helpful for me to hear your story and understand some of the barriers that you've just knocked down to the benefit of the young ladies that we're meeting today. Are you aware of any current issues that we would soon like to see as knocked down as those that you have accomplished? And I think of the first speaker mentioning that she was told flat out, we're not gonna hire women. And so I'm sure the attitude is still alive today, maybe not so obvious. So what are some of the ways in which women are still climbing those walls? Well, I can tell you my, the story that I had when I was, um, when I was implementing the laboratory information system in, in, in Mexico. I, I still remember so clearly. It was the first government um, um, hospital that was having a laboratory information system. So they were, everybody was, you know, their eyes were in the, in the lab. And um, they asked me to go and present the, the project to the Minister of Health who's a, a man, and I was pregnant, and I, when, I was, when, I'm, when I was pregnant, I, was, I always looked very, very big. Uh, believe it or not, I guess it's because of the small frame, I don't know, but I was like big, even though I was only about seven months pregnant or something like that. And he just took a look at me and said, are you gonna finish the project? And I was like, I just looked at him and I said, who do you think I am? <laughs> you, you know, point blank, you know, what, what do you think? I'm just going to leave you with this stuff here? Um, it, I, I can say that it was very hard to do, um, but at the same time, I, I, I think that he spiked me in such a way that I said, I'm just not going to let this happen. I went back to work. Obviously, you know, I gave birth to my daughter and I gave back birth. I actually, I actually gave birth to the computers two weeks before <laughs> I gave birth to my daughter. <laughs> so we, we turned on the, the, uh, the laboratory information system in January 20th, and my daughter was born February 2nd. Um, I remember receiving calls at the same time that I was giving birth, and I remember Carlos was saying, Stop it! You know, <laughs> and so um, 
I went back at two weeks uh, after having delivered. It was hard, but at the same time, you know, at that point in time, Victoria was a little thing that just needed, I, I went part-time during that period of time. She needed to be breastfed and then sleep. And so, you know, it, it, it was hard, but, you know, you do it. I, and I think the fact that people, um, the fact that people tell you that you can't, at least for me, it's almost like counterproductive. Oh, I will. These are so different now. Um, and some of the concerns of the men are legitimate. Um, but it's, it's, um, you've got to look past that bottom line and look at the value that women bring to your practice. But in radiology, it's still a really big deal that there are not a lot of um, wide open welcoming arms in the private community. So in short, I think there's still a lot of barriers. Unfortunately, yeah. unfortunately, and and you just have to realize that um, you know there's some times that you're gonna say no, I'm not gonna go there, but sometimes you're gonna say yes, I'll go and I'll do it. Uh, it so I think that you know there's some times that you say no, I'm that I'm not gonna touch, and, and and you have to sort of be selective sometimes. I think that comes more with age, you know, as as you have traveled more, you can be more selective. But I think, you know, especially at the very beginning, it may be harder to define what, what is better. And I think that's where mentorship um, is so important. It was really important. When I was part-time, you know, I took full-time call. You know, you, you, if you're part-time, you just can't be the first person out the door. I mean, that's just my, my philosophy. You just got to work a little bit differently because people have taken a risk to let you be part-time. So, I've got a question for either of you or both of you. What would you say were the biggest obstacles? Was it gender or in your case ethnicity or age at the time you were coming through? What, what were your biggest obstacles do you think? Mine was not having money. <laughs> mine was money. Class. Mm -hmm. Money opens lots of doors. So mine was not having money. Um, it wasn't gender. It was money. Yeah. I think in, in Mexico, I think there's, uh, I think gender is, is, is not so much um, an issue. I think money is a big issue. Um, but gender, we, we got supreme justices in Mexico before the U.S. got supreme justices. So, <laughs> but I, you know, I think that even though it's a macho country, you, <laughs> you end up um, with that. I think here in the States is more gender, I think people are more cognizant of that. In, in Mexico, I don't, or maybe I was so naive then. Consider of the two. <laughs> Great, thank you. Does anybody else have any questions for either of the women? Yes. So, challenges, advice for a woman who is in a situation, you know, like that with two, you know, calls, other things. Get a wife. <laughs> so, you know, I we would, tell, I would tell you, wife. since you said that so many times, at, at home I've been told we have a wife. What we really miss having is a husband. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, because he travels too much. <laughs> I may not be the one to ask because I've been married three times. Um, so I may not be the one to ask. Um, you know, you, there were so many things in Jeanette's presentation that were great. Um, balance, balance, balance in your life is so critical. Flexibility, mm -hmm. flexibility. Like you see, this new opportunity comes up. Gosh, it doesn't make sense. I don't know where this is going to go, but I'm going to do it anyway. That is such a big deal. And I guess marriage is the same way. But I haven't been very successful at it. <laughs> I, I must say that uh, Carlos um, does help. Even though he's traveling a lot, when he's at home, he, he, he helps quite a bit. You just have to say that because he's here. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions? Okay. Well, I want to thank the audience. I want to thank all of you for coming and taking the time out today to come and listen. And I want to thank our two honorees for all they've done to contribute to their field and to the school. 
Um, and we have a token for them. Let me read this to you if I can open it. Yeah. <laughs> we have a crystal paperweight that says Emory University School of Medicine, Outstanding Women in Medicine, Recognizing Outstanding Professional Accomplishments. This one is Jeanette Guarner, MD, 2014. So you are welcome. Thank you. Thank you. A beautiful one for you as well. So thank, thank you. you. So thank you all. And thank you. I'm sure these fine women will stay around for a few minutes if you want to talk to them individually. And please enjoy refreshments. I'm going to go ahead and get started. It is a little after four. Is it, I don't, is it on? If you can hear me in the back row, would you mind raising the preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.